So welcome everyone. Uh, today uh, we discuss this week's tour portion, which is a portion of Beha Alotcha. Beha Alotcha is <clears throat> the third tour portion of the book of Numbers, Bamidbar, the fourth of the five books uh, of Moses which constitute the Torah. Beha Alotcha means when you elevate when you make rise, when you elevate. Um, Hashem speaks to Moses. Uh, it, we're using the Rabbi Ari Kaplan's translation of the Torah of the Chumash. can be found on page 703 in this book, if you have the same edition as I do. And uh, we start on chapter 8, verse 1. Hashem spoke to Moses saying, Hashem uh, sent an email to Moses telling him to text Aaron and to tell him that when he elevates the candles facing the menorah the seven candles uh, the seven candles will um, will shine so first of all we're talking about the menorah which has seven candlesticks which uh, the Torah tells us here uh, was already there in desert times in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle. And later on, this menorah was also transported uh, into Israel and later on into the temples in Jerusalem, both of them. If you go to Rome, Titus Ark, you see there a depiction of uh, the menorah being um, looted and taken from Jerusalem to Rome. Um, this is the menorah. And um, last week at the end of the Parsha, Parashat Naso, we read about uh, the offerings that every leader of every tribe uh, brought forth to inaugurate the Mishkan. The tabernacle was ready to be used as a spiritual vessel to offer offerings on high. And every respective leader of every respective tribe would bring an offering. If you look at the uh, seventh portion, and even the sixth, it seems very tedious, because every head of tribe brought on behalf of his tribe the exact same offering as all the other tribes. So why does the Torah reiterate that they brought X, Y, and Z? You know... It's like saying, Joe brought X, Y, and Z, and then Steve brought X, Y, and Z, and then John brought a X, Y, and Z, and then Simon brought X, Y, and Z. Why don't you just say they all brought X, Y, and Z? One way to understand it is that Hashem wants us to bring our very best. That's all He expects from us. Hashem doesn't expect me to be, uh, to become a successful businessman like Warren Buffett because I don't have the gifts of a Warren Buffett. Hashem doesn't expect me to be like a Moses or an Aaron or an Albert Einstein. Hashem expects me to be me. Hashem expects e each and every one of us to be ourselves and to do the very best that we can and to bring Hashem the finest offering that we can from uh, that which we have to offer from uh, our soulful capacities. So um, Rashi says uh, that Aaron was a little bit upset. He had to go to therapy. Why was he upset? Because he was the Kohen, right? And the, Ko and the Kohen, and, and they didn't bring an offering to the sanctuary, to the tabernacle, to the Mishkan, because their job was to run the show. So Aaron was kind of feeling a little down. I didn't, bring, I didn't get to bring something on behalf of the Kohanim, of the Levi tribe. Um, and Hashem tells him something very interesting according to Rashi. Amar lo HaKadosh Baruch said the Holy One, blessed be he, to Aaron, when Aaron was uh, feeling down about it, that he didn't, bring an offer, he didn't get to bring an offering on behalf of the Levi tribe. You have a greater vocation, you have a greater role to play than theirs, than the other heads of the tribes. Because you are kindling and uh, preparing the candles. 
Okay. Um, so there is um, another teaching here that um, Shalayai Maim Bechanukah. Okay. So so let's focus. Let's focus on this. So today. Uh, today we have no temple. Today we have no menorah. What is the uh, practical uh, application, relevance of this um, section to our lives today in the Jewish year 57, 78, 2018? And uh, the answer is that uh, light represents vitality, energy, life. Life Light also represents godliness and sanctity. And light also represents clarity of mind. The 17th century French philosopher René Descartes, when he wanted to speak about the ability to exercise what the Brits called common sense, that we can all use our mind commonsensically, right? In England, they say a lot to kids, use your common sense, which means use your mind's reasoning, right? He called it, Descartes, the uh, French philosopher, called it la lumière naturelle de la raison, the natural light of reason. The mind has uh, a capacity to know that which is right. Um, if, if, if we have a, you know, a well-functioning, healthy mind. So... But we do make mistakes. Correct. Why do we make mistakes? And this is corrected. This is connected to this. We make mistakes because we don't take care of our minds. You know, a lot of people try to really take good care of their bodies. They think about what they eat, what they don't eat. They exercise. They try to stay away from uh, junk food or too much soda or too much dessert. But what about the mind? Do they also have a dietary nutrition, nutritional lifestyle for the mind? The mind is very important because the mind, everything flows from the mind. Hasidism teaches that the soul has three garments, thought, speech, and action. First, we think something, like, I want to stop at the 7-Eleven and eat two donuts. And then we say to somebody in the car, do you mind if I stop, if we stop on the road and get two donuts? And then I actually go into the 7-Eleven and buy the two donuts. Giving a silly example, right? So the idea is that thought comes from the mind, and our minds are influenced uh, but by how we feed our minds, right? Uh, you go online, you can feed your mind with anything. You can feed your mind with Torah. You can uh, feed your mind with uh, the opposite of Torah. You can feed your mind with anything and everything. So the idea of lighting the menorah is kindling the mind, kindling the soul. Uh, how do we kindle the soul, we pray, we meditate, we study Torah, we let ourselves sit in silence and connect to our inner rhythms, we listen to beautiful sacred melodies, soothing melodies that just open us up to uh, our inner core and the spirit of the universe. So, the mind, welcome. We were starting to get worried about you. We missed you. Welcome back. Thank you for noticing. Um, so, um, we're doing Parashat Ba'alotcha, page 703. Welcome. And so, the idea of lighting the candles of the menorah means illuminating the mind. Let me get a little bit more concrete. We wake up, and then our body br brings us down. Our body wants us to sleep a little more and then go to the fridge, fridge and eat something yummy and then we start thinking about what's for lunch and then we start thinking about the people who annoy us in life and then we think about what, <laughs> what we need to do at work. And 
So our mind is kind of held hijacked by the cravings of the body and the psychological and material challenges of life. The Hasidic masters say to kindle the menorah means to elevate and illuminate your mind. So you wake up and you go to work out. You go to the gym. Which gym? The prayer book. And you, um, and you immerse yourself in prayer. And then you try and study something. And then you have clarity. After you have done your spiritual morning exercise, you have more clarity about life. You have balanced your life's uh, worries and concerns with gratitude to Hashem, with an enhanced perspective on life. And then you can go back to your worldly that then you could go to your worldly affairs after you have elevated your mind and you uh, kindled your soul and, and you have clarity of mind. So I was saying earlier in the after the morning service that this is a little bit like in the East Coast. I remember when I lived in the East Coast Sometimes in the winter, it gets so cold that, the, that you would have ice on your windshield. And you would have to get the ice off the window so that you could drive with clarity and avoid accidents and bad things. The same thing with the mind. We have to clear and crystal clear our minds so that we can see clearly and we can walk clearly um, in life think about it's talking about the menorah from the Mishkan and temple times think about the Chanukah Chanukiah that we call menorah in America for some reason the I Hanukkah call menorah. Chanukiah yeah but I know I Men- correct everybody good so if you want to let's say you lit candles last night it's Chanukah it's, uh, let's say it's the fifth day of Chanukah and you want to light the five candles with the shamash. So what's the first thing you got to do? You got to clean the candlesticks from last night. Uh, right? So yeah, there, there's, right. <laughs> so first you have to clean and distill. And then you can have light. And then you can have clarity. Right? So that's the idea. It's the same thing in life. There is a uh, an, an expression, a term, Hasidic term, that's very prevalent in the book of Tanya, the foundational work of Chabad philosophy and psychology, authored uh, by Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, um, more than two centuries ago. And and what he's saying is that we want to be in a state where moach shalit al lev where the mind achieves dominion over the heart. The heart doesn't want to teach a Torah class. Maybe the heart wants to say that I'm sick and go home and sleep and eat, uh, order a seven-layer cake on, uh, on, on Postmates and watch Netflix and go to sleep. But the mind needs to control the heart. So that's the idea of cleaning the menorah, distilling the mind. And the seven candles in Kabbalah, uh, we have three intellectual faculties. Chokhmah, which means intuitive wisdom, or and in a sense, spark of wisdom. Bina, which is systematic understanding and Da'at, which is profound spiritual knowledge. Once you infuse yourself with profound spiritual knowledge like we're doing now, you know what you can do? You can control your emotions. You can, you can become your own boss. Once you steep yourself in godliness, then your soul becomes excited about God. And once your soul becomes excited about God, your soul wants to do that which is godly. So the seven candles that are illuminated represent the seven 
divine emanations, the seven sefirot, which are emotional, which are emotive. In other words, after you, we cleaned our mind, we can become more composed in terms of what we feel, what we crave, what we want, and what we're going to do. So that is the inner Kabbalistic, Hasidic uh, understanding of the idea of lighting the menorah. The menorah is the godly soul. The menorah is godly consciousness. So that's uh, one thing. Another thing is, of course, the seven candles. Seven represents spiritual completion in this world, right? Seven days of the week, seven days of creation. So, Shabbat. Shabbat is ideally a day of mindfulness. It's a day of soulfulness. It's a day in which we are challenged to summon the discipline and the wisdom to put on hold, on call waiting, all the stuff that we're busy with uh, in life and immerse ourselves uh, in prayer, in, 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 uh, in meditation, in uh, connection to our own inner core, to others around us, to Hashem. So once, if you, if you get, if you do that, then all seven candles will be illuminated. Your entire wor- week will be enhanced by the glow of Shabbat. That's God's day. All seven candles, all seven days of the week will be enhanced and illuminated if we connect and hone in to the spiritual energy of Shabbat. Okay? God's day. Right. So, God's day and a day of godliness in which we can become more, even more godlike than we are during the week. Now, uh, the parasha goes on <clears throat> to talk about the Levites that had a special role. They needed to be purified. And you know how swimmers, professional swimmers, sometimes shave their bodies so that they can uh, compete better? I didn't know that. Bicycle bodies. So, so, th- so the Levites <clears throat> were, you know, in spirit, they, they were part of that elite. And, and they were told uh, to do that, talks about the offerings of the Levite, and the Levites uh, were separated from amongst the rest of the, the people of Israel. They had specific roles bringing forth offerings. Um, now there's something very interesting in our parasha. It says in chapter 8, uh, verse uh, 15, it says the following uh, on page 705 in our book, he says, the, the Levites would come to serve Hashem on behalf of the people in the tent of meeting, and you, Aaron, uh, shall purify them. You should lift them as a waving. Isn't that really strange? Think about it. The Levites were lifted by others, physically lifted. Lift them as a waving. Um, for they are wholly given over to me from among the children of Israel. They are completely dedicated to divine service. They are not lawyers and they are not doctors and they are not nurses. They are only serving Hashem. Like the people today who quote-unquote only learn Torah in a kolel all day and teach Torah. They are the spiritual elite. So they are being um, lifted up as a waving. Now let me ask you a question, friends. Sometimes we see in life situations in which there's a celebratory moment or something. And we see people, and I'm not talking about when it's a special day for a person, like a bar bat mitzvah or a wedding. But which kind of people are being put on the shoulders and carried on high. Do you have any life scenarios in mind? 
again. What kind of people are being elevated, lifted, and you know that you see people, grown-ups, adults, being put on their shoulders? You know, I can think of athletes. Let's say sports team, at least in Israel, if a basketball team or a soccer team they win the championship, then the fans break into the uh, stadium, the court. Let's say it's a basketball game, and they lift all the 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 players, all the ball players, right? Or, you know, after let's say the raid on Antibe in Israel, or after the Six Day War, people lifted the military generals and sometimes the politicians. So we lift our heroes, right? Um, today we talk about celebrities, right? Many celebrities, let's say Hollywood movie stars, supermodels, what have you. In Israel, we call the celebrities Giborei Tarbut, which means cultural heroes. They are our cultural heroes. So, here, I, I want that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly where I'm going with this. That we, I think, one of uh, you know, my small idea is that Hashem wanted us to lift the Levites because they should be our heroes. They should be our role models. These are the people that we want to put on a pedestal, as we say in English, right? So it's a message to us today. Who do I put on a pedestal? Who do I look up to as my hero? Is my greatest hero the one who is a self-made billionaire? No, I can fully respect the person who became a self-made billionaire. But is he to be considered necessarily a great you know, the ultimate life role model depends on the person, right? You know, Charles Barkley, the uh, former basketball player, used to play for the 76ers and for the Phoenix Suns. He used to wear a t-shirt that I loved him for. I don't it. like, I'm not your role model. I am not a role model. Yeah. You know, I once ran into Charles Barkley in this uh, lounge in New York when I was uh, in grad school. And I have a friend in Israel, I had a friend who was a big NBA fan. So I asked Charles Barkley to write an autograph for my friend. And you wouldn't believe the dissonance, the discrepancy between how physically, you know, strong and big Charles Barkley is and what a soft personality he can be. He was like so timid. Yeah, of course I would say, you know. Um, but Charles Barkley used to wear a t shirt says, I am not a role model. What was he doing? He was protesting the people who were saying to him, you are a hero. He said, I'm not a hero. Life didn't give me an opportunity to pursue the highest education. I think he may have had gambling issues. You know, a lot of people become very successful, let's say Hollywood, sports, some, not all. But, you know, um, if they, you, you know, are they role models necessarily in life? No. Who are your role models? Your parents. Charles Barkley was basically saying to America, to American culture and to Western culture, you have a serious problem if you think that I am your role model. I am not a role model for your kids. Very, very powerful, right? The Taurus says to us, these are your role models. The role models are the people who dedicate their lives to the enhancement and betterment of other people's lives and bring more sanity and sanctity to this world. Right? If these are our role models. Right? So, that's the people uh, we want to lift, either physically or allegorically, right? Um, so this was a remark. We have a lot in this Parsha from the uh, second Aliyah. Now uh, we have in the third Aliyah, we have the issue of the Pesach Sheni, the second Pesach. So what happened is, back in the days of old, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot were celebrated in Jerusalem. Everybody will, would ascend, travel to Jerusalem. The Regalim. Right. King Herod, who was, by the way, a terrible king, who passed away a few years before the common era, built this wonderful port in Caesarea. 
which was a Roman city, now Baruch Hashem, it's a Jewish-Israeli city, so that all the Jews who lived abroad would come by, by ships to Israel to participate in the three annual pilgrimages of Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. What happened if I was, you know, going to go to Jerusalem to participate in the Pesach, Passover celebrations, and then something happened which rendered me ritually ineligible, tame, ritually ineligible to participate in the Passover national festivity. Maybe I came into a contact with a corpse or a carcass. At that time, it would disqualify me from participating until I would cleanse myself. Um, what, what is so that? so I, I don't want to get into that specific issue right so, now. So we're not supposed to be in touching. No, touch no, it, it, it's it's not it's not applicable in our times anymore. Okay. So these people came to Moses, and they said. You have to be careful what you say. We're like children. Sorry. You have to be careful what you say. We're like children. We zoom in on it. No, no, it's okay. No, these are good questions, but. Uh, right? We came, we are ritually ineligible because we came into contact with the deceased. Why can't we go like the rest of the nation on Pesach to Jerusalem and barbecue and eat the Passover lamb? Why can't we barbecue on the Jewish 4th of July, Independence Day? Yeah. So, Moses. Um, had a direct uh, line, automatic calls, what do you call it? When you just press a button and it automatically calls that person? Direct dial. Direct dial to Hashem, and Hashem says, yes. In a situation like this, you can have exactly a month after. If you couldn't perform the Seder on the... If you couldn't go up to Jerusalem on the 14th of Nisan, you can go on the 14th of Iyar. Exactly a month later. But don't think that you can say to yourself on the 14th of Nisan, Oh, you know what? I'm busy. I have an exam. I have a business deal. I have something I got to take care of. I'll do Pesach exactly a month from now. It's only if it's a, what we call in this country an act of God, a false majeure, some unforeseeable event. You know, um, I know some people who... Um, if Passover, if the first night of Passover, let's say, falls on a Thursday, on a given uh, year, they say, you know what, Thursday we're busy, it's the work week, we will have the Seder Saturday night. You know, there are people who do that. You're not really supposed to do that. You're supposed to celebrate on time. Your right? Abu-Rad does that. So, um, you're supposed to do it... Um, on the day of, right? Just like July 4th is July 4th, so to, to distinguish our spiritual July 4th, our spiritual Independence Day, should be celebrated on spiritual Independence Day. Okay? Um, now we have this whole business later on with the trumpets. Uh, Hashem tells Moses to make two silver trumpets. Um... And, and it tells us, really, uh, to use those trumpets um, on two occasions. I'll tell you where we are, fair enough. Um, chapter 9, or chapter 10, rather. Let's see. Let me see. Oh, the trumpets, it says. Yeah. Chapter, is it chapter 9? 10. Chapter 10. What page are we on? Uh, seven eleven. You see, I spoke about 7-Eleven earlier with the donuts. Um, so, 7-Eleven. Uh, right, so you see, verse, verses 9 and 11. There are two instances mentioned here when we need to blow the trumpets. One if there is a war, and the other is when there is jubilation, right? When it's a holiday. Or Rosh Chodesh. Right. So, how did you get to the different sound? Because first it says sound is staccato when, uh, you know, you're in trouble. And then it says sound a note 
with the trumpets for your burnt offerings and your peace offerings. To me, that sounds like it's two, two different sounds. Staccato, you know. Oh, that's right. Vehare otem bachatzot. Right. So, so right. That's that's very good. Thank you. So. So. Does the trumpet remind you of something else that another instrument that we blow in uh, in Judah? The Judaism? shofar. The shofar, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The shofar. What's the purpose of the shofar? Anybody remembers? Call in the new year. Call in the new year, and also wake, waking ourselves up from from starting. from pressing snooze on life, from just being yeah. going by letting life's physical, material, psychological challenges walk all over us. So the shofar is an alarm clock. Just like you use an alarm clock to wake up in the morning, there's a shofar, it's an annual alarm clock that says, ta another year over, which means one less year to live, the year that just finished. What are you doing? Are you spending your time? Are you happy with the way your life is going? Mm -hmm. Um, So here, the trumpet is being blown at a time of war, when we go to war. So on the face of it, it's when we go to a military war on the ground with another nation. But it's also really when we go to war every day to fight our inner demons, our own personal challenges. There's a famous debate between Maimonides, the great Spanish sage, and Nachmanides, the also Spanish but Kabbalistic sage. Uh, And um, One of them says that uh, to pray every day is a mitzvah from the Torah. The other one says, no, you only pray in times of war. See? You only pray in times of war. Yeah, asking for things. So, uh, uh, I'm not sure I understood. Well, if we're only praying at a a time for war, war, that's when we remember. Mm. So right, so when we're in we're harm's asking, way. Yeah, and we're asking. That's things. when we. Right. So I think the way Nach- Maimonides says, one of them says, we only pray in times of war. The other one says, the other rabbi says, we pray every day. So the way the second rabbi explains the first rabbi's words is basically this they are both right. The rabbi who says, we only pray when we need to go to war is right. And the rabbi who says we it's a commandment from the Torah of Israel to pray every day is also right. Reminds me of the story about a rabbi that two people come to him and they have a dispute and he listens to the first one and says you're right. And then uh, the second one starts speaking and listens to the second one and says you're right. And then his wife tells him how can it be? How can they both be right? So the rabbi says to his wife, you're also right. <laughs> um, so how are they both, how are they both right? Um, the answer is that every day is war. Every day is war. In the terms of uh, Hasidic psychology, every day the vital soul, the physical soul, wants to drag us down, and the godly soul wants to bring us up. It's like a candle. If you look at a candle, um, it's a very beautiful Hasidic allegory. You see the wax and you see the flame. What happens to the wax? The wax goes down, right? The wax is like the body. You know, the body wants to go to sleep. The body wants to, the body wants to put work on hold, put the legs on the table and watch a nice TV show on Netflix. Watch uh, game one of uh, the NBA Finals. And, you know, that's the body. The soul, if you look at the flame of the candle, it dances upwards. It's like the, the soul wants to let go of the body. The, want, the soul wants to soar higher. 
right? Um, so that's the fight that we have every day between the body and the soul. There's a fight going on. And that's why we have to pray every day, because every day is war. And, and we have to win every day anew. There's a wonderful uh, writer in Israel who wrote a book about this Hasidic concept of this daily war. And the name of the book in Hebrew is Lenatzeach Kol Yom Mechadash. To win every day anew. You want to achieve mind over matter every day anew. Right? Rabbi, how do we know that the body is fighting the soul and the soul is fighting the body every day? How do we know? The conscious tells us? Well, Sometimes most of us, aware. most of us have a very strong animal soul oh, that animal. wants to forget about the animal soul. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a term, but it's the physical and spiritual side of a person. The physical side of the person wants physical pleasures. And the spiritual part of the person wants godly pleasures. And there's a fight. You know what they're fighting over? They're fighting over what uh, the author of the Tanya calls a, a small city. The body is a small city. So the, 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 the spiritual self, the godly soul is saying, they're having a conversation within me. And the spiritual soul is saying, I want to put on filling on my left arm. And the physical soul is saying, I want to lie in bed and just have my left arm hugging a pillow. <laughs> I see. Right? I'm giving a silly example. Does that make sense? And there's a, there's a battle between the two. There's a battle between the physical and the spiritual. The physical wants worldly pleasures. The, the, the spiritual wants eternal pleasures. All right? Um, so that's the idea of going to war, not only militarily, but also individually. We go to war every day. Our better angels and our inner demons fight it out every day and every hour. So, good? Yeah? I'm sorry, just a yeah. stab. <laughs> sorry, it's okay, I'm fine. What happened? Okay. Sometimes I have a stabbing oh, pain. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, I'm, I'm it takes sorry. my breath away. I'm good. <laughs> okay. Um, can, can we get you some water? Yeah. No, no, okay. it goes away. It just stabs, okay. it goes away. <laughs> now I want to show us another thing. I was just noticing, uh, this year, June 17th, mm -hmm. which was when my grandfather, which he's probably on the list for Shabbat, Isaac Levy, mm -hmm. passed away, but it was the 19th of Sivan. So that's this Shabbat. Well, look how far apart it is from the days. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's go to chapter 10. You have to pay attention. Verse 35. Do you notice something cool? Page 714. Go to page 714. I know it's the Hebrew. And look at the beginning of verse 35. Do you see something there? It looks like a telephone. Right. It looks like an, a 20th century cell phone. Or a bracket. Where? And then go to the end of oh, verse 36, and you see that bracket or 20th century phone again, right? Again, too. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So guess what? Um, there are commentators who say that these two verses, verses 35 and verses 36 of chapter 10 of Parshat Baalotcha in the book of Numbers, they are an entire book in and of itself. What kind of a book are they? According to one commentary, they are the book of Jewish history. Why? Because it says in verse 35, you see between those two... By the way, these two signs are also appear in the Torah scroll itself. 
from which we read. So it says, Vayibin so Aaron vayomer Moshe. When we were on the move, remember when the great Dr. King used to say, we're on the move now. When we were in the, on the move in the desert, carrying the tabernacle with us, including the ark, and inside the ark, what do we have? The, the, the Ten Torah Commandments, the Ten right? Commandments. The Torah, the Ten Commandments. Just the Ten Commandments, not the whole Torah? Um, depends on the uh, commentators and, and also when. Certainly the Ten Commandments. Certainly the Ten Commandments. Um, so it came to pass when we were traveling in the desert and the ark was also being moved around with the Ten Commandments inside. Moshe. And Moses said to the people, Kuma Hashem ve'yafutsu ve'yanusu Rise up. That's something we sing. Right, we do sing it. We sing it uh, when we. Um, it, it, right, this is this is sang in Ashkenazi and Hasidic communities as we open the Ark of oh. the Torah on Shabbat morning to take out the Torah. Vayehi bin so Aaron vayomer Moshe kuma Amonai veyafutzu oivecha veyanusu mesanecha mipanecha. What does it mean? It means when we were on the road and we were carrying also the ark with the Ten Commandments. Moses would say to Hashem, Hashem, help us out, rise, and let your enemies be scattered, and those who hate you. Flee from you. Who hates Hashem? Usually the people who hate the Jewish people. The Nazis hated the Jews the most. They were the most ungodly people. Right? The Stalinists. Well, I don't know they about that. The right? we the I so, mean, they murdered we the, the most godly. people. But what so, about... We were the godly people. That's why they didn't like us. Uh, yeah, because we God. brought to the world... We were the vehicle through which God gave the world the Torah and the Bible and the whole moral system based on the Bible. Sorry, Judith, you were saying? Well, the Hitler is in modern times and we have this, the story and we know what happened that six million people were, were murdered. But, but what about uh, the ones that destroyed the temples? Those are uh, in the beginning. Yeah, what about... Weren't those horrible people even more yeah, yeah. horrible? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they were more horrible than the Nazis. That's a little hard, but... But, but they were certainly uh, ungodly. They rejected uh, monotheism. They reje- so these were, you know, idolatrous civilizations, pagan civilizations. But the point here is that when we are moving around as a people, when the Jewish people are traveling and we are in harm's way, as we are in our exile, right? And we've been moving in our two millennia exile throughout the world from one country to another and then we came to a new place carrying our Torah scrolls with us and carrying our Talmuds and we would pray that as we move from one place to another across the globe because we were the world's first global people, today everyone's global that our enemies will move away from us, they'll leave us alone so we can just live in peace and support our families and study Torah and try to live the best life that we can. So when we are on the go, we ask Hashem to protect us from our enemies. On the other hand, uh, verse 36, but when we parked, when we sat still in one place, shuva Hashem rivevot al Faisal, return uh, Hashem to the tens of thousands of Jews of Israel. In other words, when did we leave a place in Jewish history? When did we leave Morocco, Germany, Greece, Iran, Egypt, when things were bad? People usually don't move, certainly en masse, unless things are bad. If things are good, why would you move? Why would you move? Right? Today things are good in LA. They're good for the Jewish community. The economy is pretty good. Why move? So when people move, things are not good. So we ask for God's protection. But Uvenucha, but when we are put 
We stay put in LA because it's sunny and there are beautiful palm trees and there are 750,000 Jews living here, Baruch Hashem. So you have everything you need to live, live a beautiful Jewish life and there are other wonderful people, non-Jewish people living here and it's just wonderful to live here. So what, does, what do we ask of Hashem when we are just sitting still in a nice place like LA? Return to Hashem, the multitudes of the Jewish people. Don't forget Hashem when you're staying put and just sunbathing on Santa Monica Beach. <laughs> when we are in danger, may Hashem protect us from our enemies. When we are just cruising and everything is just swell, the Hashem help us not to abandon our relationship with Him and our own godliness. Let Him help return the Jewish people back to their ultimate and true identity and role in this world, which is to be spiritual, to be godly. Very interesting, right? Yes. So now we continue uh, with chapter uh, 11. Did I tell you the joke about chapter 11? Uh, you know, remember that? I told you, um, no. you know, there are people who say the, 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 bo- the book of Psalms, Tehillim, people read it to gain spiritual strength and, and, and insight. And there are some people who say, just open. Ah! Oh, no. Got, and there are no paper towels or napkins in here. Don't even bother. I just look. There's nothing. Well, um, okay. Um, She's running to the bathroom to get paper towels. That's very sweet of her. Okay. So, um, so now we are... He's got something. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, she's gone. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's... Thank you so much, Leah. It's the computer uh, uh, let, let, let me do it, please. Let's continue the class. Thank you it's very much. It's what's yeah. well, Oh, okay. It's good. The computer. Yeah, yes. Not the table. So, yeah. Well, it's just... Was Hashem trying to say something to you? No, it's that's, good. That's, it's that, good luck. It's that, good that's, luck. Uh, please, let, let me handle it. Let's everybody help check their seats so we can continue the class. <laughs> please. Please take your okay. seat. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah. So, um... So... The next part of the Torah, I started telling the joke, right, about chapter 11. So they say, wherever you open uh, Tehillim, you, you, you know, wherever you, you open the book of Psalms, you can pray. So this guy goes to his rabbi and he's devastated and he says, you know what? I, I just, um, I lost everything, you know, what should I do? So the rabbi says, well, you know, you've got to be proactive. You've got to figure out how to, you know, rebuild your life. But... You know, meanwhile, just uh, read some Tehillim, read some Psalms, and pray to Hashem. Thank you. And, um, and uh, so, the, so the guy asked the rabbi, well, which chapters of Tehillim, of the Psalms, should I uh, pray to Hashem? So he says, it doesn't matter. Just open a book of Psalms, randomly, wherever it opens, start praying. So the guy opens the uh, book of Tehillim, and he says, it says chapter 11. <laughs> All right. Um, too much buildup for a casual joke because I spilled some uh, tea on my phone and and uh, what do you call it? iPad. An iPad. Okay. Keyboard. It'll be okay. It's on the keyboard. So the next part of the Parsha is about the meat frenzy. This is a, a place where, you know, we're talking about the daily struggle between the, our physical side and our spiritual side. This is a place where uh, our people became addicted. We became addicted to restaurants. We thought the most important thing in the world is going to restaurants. As if you can't just eat nice, simple food at home, and, and, and that would be fine too, right? So everybody wanted to eat meat. There was a crazy meat frenzy. And they say to Moses, you know something? The meat restaurants were way better in Cairo, in Egypt. And also the daga, the sushi. There's a nobo in, uh, in Cairo. The sushi was way better. We want to go back to Egypt. We want to be slaves. 
we, um, we, we don't care about being slaves, you know, whether it is spiritual slaves or political slaves, both, as long as we can go to nice restaurants. That's the purpose, that's the most important thing in life, to eat good food in good restaurants. So, um, the end of the story is that they were fed so much meat uh, that they got sick of it. Wow. Which is a little bit, really, actually what, what happens in life, right? It's uh, like President Bush, George W. Bush, once said that he was drinking and drinking and drinking until he got sick of it. And then his wife told him, it's either me or the bottle. But the point is, sometimes people get really obsessed with something, and they can't let go, they can't stop until they're sick of it. So they got, they, got, they were given the meat and they ate so much meat until they got sick of it. There's a point where hopefully people just get sick of banging their heads against the wall, of doing things that are hurtful to them. Actually, my, my daughter has this book, sometimes I read to her, about a, a family of bears. I remember the name of it. And, the, and the, the girl, every day she wants to eat uh, the same thing, which is a peanut butter sandwich. And her mother plays along. She says, okay, you can have a peanut, uh, Francis, that's, that's her name. And, and until she, 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 she can't take it anymore, herself, right? And she decides to, quote unquote, change her ways, right? So, um, so it's the same thing, you know, people, uh, just, um, that, that's what happens, right? It's a it, phenomenon. I just read an article yesterday mm -hmm. yeah. in uh, Southern Europe, yeah. Mediterranean region, yeah. that the people, because they have more money and they're doing better, they're no longer eating the Mediterranean diet. Uh -huh. And they are having, for the first time, an obesity problem like never before because they're eating processed foods, um, more like it would be called an American diet. Interesting. But, I, you know, I'm talking about, you know, life in general. I'm talking about people who, you know, just... Uh, well, that's what's happening get, They get have the money scotch. now, yeah. and they, they are just yeah. splurging. Yeah. And yeah, but, but I, th not healthy. I, I, th I think I think the point here is priorities in life. You know, I don't think it's about food. Right. I think food is just an allegory that people say, you know, the most important thing in my life is the luxury. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the best stakes, mm -hmm. you know, the most important thing in my life, I have to take that cruise every year. That specific luxurious cruise. That's the most important thing, you know. More than anything, more than being able to have <laughs> my kids go through religious school, whatever it is. When, when, when some physical delight, right, when some becomes the end all of life. <coughs> and, and that's kind of like what we live for. It could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be... Well, a certain kind of cars, so whatever, whatever it may be, it's when people take something physical, some sort of a material substance, mm -hmm. and they become so attached to it, and say, you know what, I don't care about my well-being, I don't care about my moral state, I don't care about my spiritual state, I don't, you know, I just want to have that specific type of enjoyment in my life. I gotta have that, right? Um, and, and Moses has a breakdown here. That's really the fascinating thing. Moses has a breakdown. It's something I'm trying to work on for this Shabbat sermon, I'll tell you. It's the idea that everybody has a breaking point. You know, Churchill suffered from terrible depressions. Golda Meir thought about committing suicide when she was Prime Minister of Israel a few days after the Yom Kippur broke out, because she realized she's responsible for this. Yeah. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, I, I, I heard him quite recently say in an interview that at some point he was seriously considering resigning as chief rabbi of Great Britain. There was a controversy about a book which he published after 9-11 called The Dignity of Difference, 
when he says one of the pathologies of the world is that every religion thinks that it has the exclusive truth and no other religions have no claim to truth at all. And that can cause a lot of enmity and even wars. And some people on the ultra-Orthodox fringes of British society didn't take kindly to that. And he had to retract certain parts of his book and, and he was really bothered by it. He thought about resigning. And I was really surprised. This rabbi thought about resigning. You know, but, but we have more extreme cases, right? Golda Meir thought about ending her own life. So you see people that you think they are greater than life and suddenly you realize that just like everybody else, they have a breaking point. And this is what happens to Moses here, right? So we are on page 717, uh, verse 12, right? And, and Moses just has enough of, of these people. Uh, let's start with verse 11. Moshe el Hashem. Moses says to God, Lama Why are you being so mean to me, your servant? <clears throat> La, I'm skipping a little bit. Lasumet That I have to carry all these people on my back. They're like kids. They're infantile. Did I give birth to them? Am I their mommy? Am I his mommy that you should tell me I should care them? Like the um, nurse, the nanny carries an infant in uh, Roxbury Park. Verse 13. They all want meat. They all want sushi. I have no sushi here. Why are they crying? I'm purposely switching it to sushi so it's more culturally relatable. Right? We must have sushi. Without sushi, we don't have life. Uh, I can't carry all these people on. It's too heavy for me. It's too weighty. It's too burdensome. Here comes the punchline. Fasten your seatbelts. Verse 15. If that's how it's going to be, Horgeni Naharog, kill me and I shall be killed. You know, that's what they call in psychology and psychiatry suicidal ideation. You know, I might as well die. He's depressed. I can't live like this. If you like me, kill me and I shall be killed. And I shall not be responsible for all this. I won't. So, first of all, it's a very powerful moment, right? It's so easy to glimpse over it. And oftentimes we do. But what we see here is Moses having a breakdown. And it's part of the greatness of the Torah. Um... Uh, King Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, in Kohelet, "En Adam tzadik baaretz asher yaseh tov velo yicheta." There's no such thing as a person who only does good in this world and never sins. Everybody messes up. Mm-hmm. Secondly, everybody has a breaking point. Right? We're all, in the words of Nietzsche, the title of one of his books, "Human, all too human." And this is where Moses goes through a great crisis. And Hashem tells him, you need peers who can help you and that you can also be with. Seventy sages are going to help you out. How are they going to help you out? Not only can you delegate to them so that they can take some of the work off, but also you would have a peer of like-minded people that you can talk with them about your difficulties and you can find support in each other. Right? Uh, So you can have a group of people that you can uh, socialize with as well. Um, So this is a very powerful part and very dramatic part, very intense. And I think that... um, What kept Moses going is the sense that he has an important role to play. 
We all have important roles to play in this world, right? We tutor people. We do things. And ultimately, it's those relationships with others that keep us going, right? If there would be no others, the others would not support us. But the others also give us a sense of relevance, a sense of usefulness. You know, um, very sadly, people who are unemployed for a long period of time, not because they don't want to work, but because they can't find work, but they really, you know, what did we call the greatest economic crisis in the history of our nation in the United States? The Depression. What did we call the Depression? Because people get depressed. They get really down if life is just about them. And it eats <coughs> the human soul alive. And I believe that what gave Moses the boost to overcome his breakdown, what gives all of us the power to overcome our breaks, is to know that there are others around us who love and care about us and support us, and we love and care about them, and that they are worthy things for us to do in this world that can also benefit others, right? And um, that's what kept Moses going, which reminds me of one of my favorite Churchill quotes. I, may have, I don't know if I mentioned it in our class before. Success is not final. When you're on the high horse in life, Success is not final. So right now, business is booming. Maybe we don't know how business is going to be next year. Success is not final. As the sages say, Lolo Lam Chosen. Fortitude is not perpetual. Success is not final. And failure is not fatal. Just because I was crushed today, God forbid, and doesn't mean that that's going to be the rest of my life. It's now. Success is not final and failure is not fatal. It is the ability to continue that matters. It is the ability to continue that matters. And that's why the Shulchan Aruch, the opening book of Jewish law, the most authoritative book of Jewish law, Starts with two words, ke'ari yitgaber, which means he shall overcome like a lion and summon himself or herself to serve Hashem. Ke'ari yitgaber v'yityatsev la'avodat habore. A person should overcome like a lion and summon oneself to serve Hashem. Overcome what? Overcome everything including uh, all the blows that life hands us, right? Yitgaber. Um, we shall overcome, right? was a great slogan during the civil rights movement, but there was a great, ingenious, orthodox thinker, philosopher in Israel, Shaya Leibovitch, wrote a book about him in Israel once, and he had five different PhDs in sciences and... Once he came to speak between, before reserve soldiers in Israel, reservists, and the person who presented him wanted to pump them up intellectually. So he said, Professor Leibovitch has five doctorates. And Leibovitch got up and said, why does this matter? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but the point is that Leibovitch was a great man. And when they asked him to define Judaism, he, he, there were times when he would define Judaism with one word. He would take his index finger, and go like this, which means, it's one word in Hebrew, shall overcome. Mm. Yeah. The, spirit, the, the spiritual self will overcome the physical self. Right? Mm -hmm. The ability to bounce back will overcome um, the propensity to despair. Right? It's about overcoming adversity, right? Um, it's the hallmark feature of our history as a Jewish people. It should also be a hallmark feature of 
that we have as individuals, right? It says in the opening chapter of Exodus Shmot that Pharaoh, you know, smothered us and smothered us and smothered us. But the more he decreed against us, including the genocide of the Jewish male infants, declared genocide on us, the more we were tortured, the more we burst forth in tenacity and strength. Right? So, um, so I think... Well, well the, the last part of the Parsha is about when Moses and Aaron speak, speak ill. Yeah. Mo- sorry, Miriam and Aaron speak ill of Moses and his wife. And I think what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to read my little piece about that specific part in the Jewish Journal on Table for Five. Oh, or, you're on the Table for Five this week? Yeah, or I will send it as an enhanced article uh, on Friday as a Shabbat Shalom message. The bottom line is I was asked to write a commentary on the Pasuk where Moses prays for Miriam. And it's a very short prayer. Kel na refana la, Anna. Please, Hashem, heal her. So what I wrote is that it's strange. I don't know, did you see it on Facebook? No, I okay. saw it, but I couldn't read it at that time. What I wrote is that, um, why does Moses pray for Miriam? Because, um, you know, there's a phenomenon in life. Sometimes there are people who are really with you when you're down. But suddenly when you are doing really well, they sometimes can even get resentful or something. It's almost like they want it's you to be there. foul weather friend. Right. So, so, Moses, uh, so Miriam and Aaron were always there for Moses when he was in need, right? Miriam saved his life, saved his life as an infant. And Aaron was a spokesperson when he, Moses had a speech impediment. Suddenly Moses is like this huge success story. He is uh, the greatest prophet ever. And they start being resentful, and they say in this section, why does Moses think he's such a big shot? We also experienced revelation from Hashem. And what about his wife, and this and that? And then um, Miriam is struck by leprosy, by tzara'at. And tzara'at is not really leprosy. It's kind of like a Torah code for the way we pollute ourselves internally when we speak in vile ways about others. So Moses prays for her. Why does Moses pray for her rather than be insulted? Most of us, when people uh, hurl abuse at us, we get really upset. And then we want to say something abusive back. And then we can't stop thinking about it. And then we talk about it with the entire world so that they'll tell us how right we are and how bad they are. But Moses prays for her. Moses prays for her because he understands that what we call today toxic people, people who frequently talk in abusive ways to others, it's because they are not well. They have an emotional and mental deficit. And when they speak in abusive ways to others, they're simply vomiting out their own sickness and their own pain. It's, a, you know, people who are very embittered usually are the people who speak in a very vile way about others. Moses understands that his sister at that point is in need of healing. Instead of taking it to heart, he prays for her. And I think it's a beautiful tip that we're getting from Moses here. You know... Um, if you're going to go to a synagogue on Shabbat or next time you go, I want to ex- uh, invite you to uh, perform an experiment. Choose a part of the service. Let's say when they open the Torah or when it's Birkata Konim. When you're going to think about the handful of people who caused you a lot of pain in your life, people who are really mean to you, and think about them, And think about how most probably they were mean to many other people. You're just one of their victims. And understand that they're sick and wish them healing. That's what Moses did, right? So that's the end of that.
And uh, we will stop here and wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for coming.